I'm Rob LaCuria, Senior Editor at Gold Derby here with Stephen Canals, who co-creator, executive producer and director on the critically acclaimed and Emmy-winning drama Pose, which is now airing its third and final season. Stephen, it took many years to get a show like Pose on the air, and it's all the more exciting that it became a hit and also a milestone in recent pop culture for transgender and queer representation and storytelling. So when all is said, are finally said and done, what aspect of this show do you want audiences to remember the most? It's a great question. Um, you know, I hope that, well, I hope for our audience members who happen to be queer and trans, I hope that they watch the show and know that they are worthy of love and they deserve to take up space unapologetically. I hope they know that their voice is important. Um, and then I think for for everyone else, um, and I think in particular for folks who who work in the industry, I hope that they recognize that stories about historically marginalized communities and specifically stories about queer and trans people aren't simply niche. You know that niche is really becoming the mainstream, and that our modern day audience really is craving specificity. Um, which is what we've given them for, for three seasons. And so I hope that the show, the lasting legacy of the show is to open up the door um, for more of these stories that have typically and historically been looked at as fringe um, taking center stage. Yeah, I think that is such a, a massive achievement for a show like this. And, you know, representation is not just a throwaway word anymore, and it should never have been. And not only does this show shine a well overdue spotlight, on the trans and gender non-conforming community, but it's also primarily black and Latinx and people of color. And I'm just wondering, um, do you look forward to a time or do you think we are almost at a time where we don't have to sit up and take notice of representation of fringe communities because it will be so commonplace and prevalent? I hope so. <laughs> I mean, that's the goal. I think that uh, myself, along with my co-conspirators over at Disney and FX, and, and certainly a lot of my contemporaries who are working tirelessly to tell the stories of, you know, Black, Indigenous, people of color, and women, and LGBTQ plus people, like that is, that's ultimately the goal, is for our stories to take up as much space as stories um, from our mainstream counterparts. You know, I think that at the time that I wrote the first draft of Pose, television was being dominated by white, straight, cisgendered male anti-heroes. Um, and th the reason that I even took to the page to write that original draft of this story was because I wasn't seeing myself and I wasn't seeing my communities take up space in television. Like we were not populating television anywhere. Um, and so, you know, I say all that to say that I, I think that what you've just, what you articulated is the goal, is to have more of these stories be told. Yeah, and I don't want to sound Pollyanna about this, but I must say, just from my own personal experience, when I watch Pose, I, I eventually do forget about the, you know, that side of it, the representation, because I get so um, entranced with these characters. And I think that is what is so great about Pose is the characters. It always hits me when I follow Blanca and Electra and Angel and Prey and Lulu and, and Puppy, how a lot of what underpins their, uh, their motivations um, is this fundamental need that we all have, all of us, to be accepted and loved and to find and nurture our purpose in life, right? And that is extremely universal and that's what really hits me the most. So do you agree that that is the common thread of these three seasons of Pose as we near the finale? Absolutely. I mean, the it's by design that we leaned all the way into the universal truths. You know, uh, the show was considered groundbreaking before it ever was airing on FX, you know? This was a show that everyone was discussing because in our announcement of it, we were making history by casting not one, but five black trans women all in series regular roles. 
you know, and our lead, our protagonist is an Afro-Latin trans woman, you know, the character Blanca played by MJ Rodriguez. And so <clears throat> we were hyper aware of that, but, you know, my concern was always that, you know, our audience would sort of look at the show as being solely a show for queer and trans people. Um, and so we made that very specific choice in the room to, again, lean all the way into the universal truths of what it meant to exist in New York in the 1980s. Um, and so our show, it's a family drama, really and truly. It's about a chosen family or a found family, but ultimately it's a family drama. And so the show is about love. It's about resilience. It's about you know, knowing how to use your voice. It's about all of the joys and the complications of just existing um, and trying to find your way in the world. Um, and I think that those are all themes and, and narratives that anybody can relate to. Absolutely. And I just why I hope people do give it a chance to people who haven't even seen it yet, because it is not as niche as even I was expecting when I first um, embarked on watching it years ago. Um, I think it was the episode with the red shoes back in season one where I was like, oh, man, mm. this show, this is something. And it makes you feel things that we want every show to make us do. Let's talk about directing, because um, you directed three of the seven episodes in the final season, two, which is the um, intervention episode five, and then seven, the series finale. I just want to go straight to the big final hurrah. Obviously, we're not going to spoil anything, but and this might sound like an obvious question, but I, I really do honestly genuinely want to know, did it live up to your expectations? Because I'm sure that expectation for the finale for yourself would have been very high. Um. Absolutely. I mean, it, it was a it was a daunting task. Um, it was a very long shoot because it's a long episode. Um, you know, we, we shot for double what we normally would film an episode. So we, I was filming for about 20 days. Um, and this was all in the midst of a global pandemic. You know, we I just finished filming the finale in March. So um, you know, we were st we were still in New York and still having to deal with wearing lots of protective gear and and staying safe. Um, and so it was it was challenging. Um, in addition to all of that, um, you know, my beloved grandmother who co-parented me passed away halfway through the filming of the finale. So it was a re it was really emotionally taxing. Um, in addition to being physically exhausting, but you know, the episode is everything that I could have ever wanted it to be. You know, it has all of the emotional highs and lows that I think all of our previous episodes and seasons have always provided to our audience. And so I'm really proud of the work because I think, you know, uh, it, the episode in particular, I think really embodies all of the things that Pose has always wanted to accomplish. Yeah. Um... I can safely say it was immensely satisfying. Um, thankfully, I've seen it. Um, what's the, what is practically the most challenging part of being in the director's chair for an episode while you're also serving as co-creator and co-writer and showrunner? Well, I mean, I, well, there's a couple of challenges. I think the greatest being having to wear all of those hats all at the same time. Um, I'm really fortunate in that I have incredible collaborators in, especially in Ryan Murphy, um, who is also a co-creator and an executive producer. And so if there's any time that I feel like I am off or if I'm second guessing a choice, I know that I always have him as a sounding board, which is fantastic. Um, you know, because there are definitely moments where and I think the finale, there, there were a couple of moments where, I, you know, there were scenes that I wrote um, and I was prepped to go in and shoot them. And then, you know, I'm literally in the midst of blocking a scene and I'm thinking, I don't know if this dialogue works anymore. I don't know if this makes sense. And, and sometimes I think it's just also being a Virgo, <laughs> like I'll <laughs> overthink things. Um, so I'm like, am I overthinking it? And, you know, it's like canals, just, just film it. It's fine. But um, but it's always great to know that I have really incredible folks around me so that I can sort of talk out those moments. Um, I tend to overthink on the page much more than I do as a director. I think for me, um, the process of being on set is so, 
it just vibrant and alive and it's so immediate and it you know forces all of your senses to just be on you're very present um and so you know what the most important to me when I'm directing is just to hold space for my actors because we're asking them to go to these really emotional, very personal places. Um, and so much of, of my cast's lived experience finds its way on the page, sometimes inadvertently, you know, and I think that's the case. And, I, and again, I don't want to ruin it for anybody who's watching, but there are a lot of moments in our finale that we're very familiar for our cast. And so for me, it's just really important that I'm holding space for them so that they can go to those paces, go to those scary places and know that they are always gonna be safe. Yeah, I mean, I I can't say it enough that I, the way that this series ended w was very satisfying. And um, right. and because everyone shines, you know, and, and for the whole season from the awesome Trunk episode, for Electra to the series finale and and what happens with Angel and Poppy. So you've been quoted as saying that, um, you know, you wanted to end the series on this high note uh, because, you know, the first season clearly stated what these characters wanted and the third season's about them actually getting to those goals. It's still heartbreaking that the show's over though. And I'm just wondering, is that really, are you happy that you've come full circle with this show and you've ended it on a high note rather than keep going? Absolutely. I mean, when Ryan and I first met and discussed what the show could be, very quickly, we knew exactly what the end was going to be. Um, and so that was always our goal. That's always what we were narratively working towards. Um, and I think what was really important coming into this third and final season, and I should note that we'd made the decision that this would be the final season prior to the pandemic. So the pandemic really didn't have anything to do with that decision. You know, what was really important for me was to get us to everything that you see in this final season. And I didn't want to create filler. You know, I'm a, I'm a real lover and a consumer of television. Um, and I think, you know, I've never, I've always treated, I should say, I've always treated our audience with a lot of respect. And I think today's modern day audience have very discerning tastes. And I think they can suss out very quickly when, when narrative has just been thrown together. And so as opposed to making a right turn and adding in extra seasons just for the sake of having the show go on, I thought, no, like we already know what we've been barreling toward from the beginning. So just allow the story to go there. And so I know that yeah. that's difficult for the audience, but I came into this process knowing exactly the story that I wanted to tell. And it just so happens that I only needed three seasons to do that. Yeah, and there were three really great seasons and we really congratulate you on a very great third season. Thanks for joining us today, Stephen. We'll bring you back shortly Thank for you. our panel discussion. Great, Thank you.